Right. Well, good evening. Um, let me start with a question. Uh, who of you out there have thought about the intersection between uh, FPGAs and low latency trading? Um, I know I hadn't uh, thought about it much. Uh, I got a phone call about 11 years ago from Optiver uh, asking me if I was interested in an FPGA engineering role. And I remember thinking to myself, what on earth is this company doing with, uh, with FPGAs? They're a trading firm. Well, in the next 15 minutes, I hope to give you a little bit of insight into um, why and how we use FPGAs in this domain. Uh, little agenda for this talk. Um, first, I'll explain a little bit about what uh, trading really is, uh, and that can give me a basis for explaining how FPGAs actually fit in uh, to this domain. Um, I'll then talk a little bit about the architecture of an FPGA-based trading system, and finally, I'll discuss a little bit about how the uh, how we approach design for FPGAs at Optiver and how it's a bit different than how other companies which makes use of FPGAs approach them. A uh, little introduction maybe first on Optiver and myself. Uh, Optiver itself was founded in uh, 1986 in Amsterdam. It's a global market making firm. Uh, it means we're a trading firm. We trade all kinds of things uh, but predominantly options, futures, ETFs, stocks. And that kind of thing. And we do all of this with our own capital. Uh, we don't have any clients. This is all done internally. Um, and what's our goal here uh, in the marketplace? It's to improve the market and we do that by showing liquidity. Um, and what does that mean? That means if, if you want to buy something, uh, we'll sell it to you. If you want to sell something, we'll buy it from you. Um, but always at prices that we are publishing uh, yeah, to, the, to the market at large. Um, we are a global company. So we've got offices around the world, and from those offices, we can cover uh, exchanges around the world. Um, Amsterdam, of course, which is well where I'm based, um, but we also have offices in London, Chicago, Sydney, and Shanghai. Um, about me personally, I've been with Optiver for about 11 years now, which maybe tells you something about how my phone call with them went 11 years ago. Um, and in that time, I've, uh, I co-wrote uh, the first uh, FPGA-based trading system that we had and went on to design and implement and uh, 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 numerous other uh, systems uh, in the last 11 years uh, to bring at, to want to add new features and to, to, to bring these systems to new exchanges. So what's trading really? Um, yeah, we see, it, we have a photo here. This is a trading pit. This is the way that trading was done, uh, well, and still is done to some degree for uh, 400 years. It's been done like this people yelling at each other in a, in a cluster. Um, and what's actually happening here is that one of these people will be saying something like, I wanna buy five shares of, of Apple for 10 euros. And anyone around this person, or at least with an earshot, uh, can, can hear that and think, oh, is that a good deal or not? Uh, and if it is, then they can yell back, uh, I wanna sell five shares to you. And that's how a trade is done. Now. In the last 25 years, um, this type of trading has largely been replaced with electronic trading. And that, what does that look like? It looks like, looks like this uh, these days. So this is a data center. And what happens now is um, an exchange, a market, can rent physical space um, in, in this data center where they can install their own servers, their own network equipment, and this kind of thing. But so can market participants can also um, rent space uh, in, in, this, in this data center and install their own equipment. Um, but how, how do we actually communicate here? And that's, that's one of the keys. In, in, in the old style, it was by yelling. In this new style, electronic trading, it's by sending ethernet packets. So these, these data centers will provide 10 gigabit network connectivity generally, um, which you can use to communicate with the exchange. So now when somebody wants to buy five shares of Apple for 10 euros, they have to encode that information into, an, into a network packet and send it to the exchange's central server. Uh, at that point, the exchange can uh, rebroadcast that information to all market participants. Um, now, where does the latency angle come in? Where, do the, yeah, where does the latency come in here? So imagine that more than one person wants to sell 
to the single buyer. Imagine a thousand people want to sell to the single buyer. Yeah, how, how do we solve that problem? Because from the exchange's point of view, there's going to be a thousand orders all coming in at the same time, or near the same time. Um, and one of the ways that an exchange can solve that problem is by implementing a, a kind of first come, first serve style mechanism. And then you can start to see why the latency angle starts to matter, which is, yeah, the first one to get their order back to the exchange will be the one who can affect the trade. Um, so knowing that latency is important, um, what are the limitations of a, of a software-based trading system? Um, here we can see uh, on, the, on the left, we have our exchange, who's going to be broadcasting information, um, and then it's going to hit our server. And on the server, we're going to have a software application which you know, needs to understand what's happening uh, in order to take a trading decision. But in order for the software application to see this, we're going to have to first traverse the NIC. So this is a network interface card. We're then going to have to traverse PCI Express. And then we get into our, you know, our CPU and memory um, where we're going to have you know, our, our application running. Now, in this chain, um, we're going to be incurring a latency penalty crossing this guy, crossing PCI Express. But of course, even software applications are going to have their own variance and latency with respect to getting access to an actual CPU core. Imagine the kernel wants to start doing something on the processor you're running on and you get booted off. That's going to incur a latency hit. Um, as well on the memory side, imagine that the memory you're trying to access gets dropped out of cache and you're going to have to go you know, further away to get the information you actually need. That's also going to introduce a lot more variance in your, in your latency. Because ultimately what we're trying to do here is get market data into your application, take a trading decision and get back out again. And there's a lot to accomplish there. So how can FPGAs help us? Um, in this next slide, uh, it doesn't look that much different, but there is a key difference, which is the NIC has been replaced with an FPGA. So what if we can cut away all of the uh, extra overhead latency of, of PCI Express and our software application and CPU and memory problems? And we can do that by trying to place all the logic we need to take a trading decision as close as possible to the network. And that would be here in the FPGA. So if we, if we dive deeper into the FPGA, we can actually start to see what, what the skeleton of, a, of, a, of an FPGA-based trading system looks like internally. Um, so what do we have here on the, on the top left? So we'll have our, our market data. So this will be 10 gig ethernet, um, some you know, network traffic being broadcast indicating the state of the market. Somebody wants to buy, somebody wants to sell, that kind of thing. What do we have to do in order to take a trading decision on this information? Well, one of the first things that we're gonna to need to do is kind of unpack the lowest level ethernet protocols here. There's some physical layer things we have to take into account and we use a Mac to help us with this. Um, but the output of this uh, here will be uh, effectively a, a packet stream, a network stream. Um, because this is ethernet, um, there's gonna be a number of uh, networking headers uh, on top of the actual payload that we care about. So there's gonna be ethernet header, an IP v4 header, a UDP header, uh, and these kinds of things. And th these, what we can implement here in this first block, in the market data handling block, is, is a filter. Um, on these networks, there's gonna be other networking equipment blabbing stuff we don't really care about, maybe like routing protocol, updates and that kind of thing and we don't want any of that to hit our trading logic that's stuff we want to ignore so we can filter out based off of you know uh, higher level um, header information secondly we can use these filters to only select the instruments that we really care about generally exchanges will partition the 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 stocks uh, that that are being traded on these exchange by multicast group so if you know you only care about a subset of, of instruments you can also apply a filter at this stage to only you know, get access to the instruments you really care about. So once you've gotten rid of your, your networking headers, uh, you're left with just your payload. And this is uh, where you know, the meat of the, um, of the order message really is, that somebody wants to buy five shares uh, at 10 euros. Now, every exchange tends to encode all this information in their own native format. So you'll have to consult 
you know, the, the relevant exchange. But generally, what the way this will work is that uh, the first couple bytes of the payload will have some kind of uh, information which tells you what the structure of the rest of the packet looks like. Um, so that could be that this is a trade, or that this is the end of the trading day and it's time to turn off. Or it could be that somebody wants to buy five shares of Apple for 10 euros. So once you, once you know what kind of message this is, then you can start to unpack the stuff behind it. Um, and that could be like the next four bytes could indicate uh, the instrument ID. So is, it, is this Apple, is this Google, is it Tesla, is it whatever? Um, and then you behind next four bytes behind that could be this is the price that somebody's willing to pay, represented in as a as a single precision float, for example. Uh, and then the following four bytes could be the volume, how many shares does someone want to buy? So once you've unpacked all that information in the in the market data handling block, you can then pass it downstream to your to your trading logic. I, I won't go into too much detail about what we do at Optiver here. Um, but you could implement, you know, your very simple strategy, which could just be if anyone is ever willing to buy Apple for more than eight euros, then sell, sell your share of Apple to that person. So, yeah, up to you to implement what you actually want in this block. Um, leaving this block, you'll have your order. You need to send something back to the exchange to, to cause a trade to happen. Um, and what one of the problems that you'll, you'll face is that um, just like the market data is encoded in a, in a market specific format, so are the orders. So we need to make sure that all the information is placed in the right spot and encoded in the right way. Um, and, and that can also be quite a challenge because sometimes exchanges like really um, unfortunate encodings like ASCII, sometimes we need to convert like binary numbers to ASCII representation to make them accepted by the exchange, which is not that fun. Um, so that's, that's what kind of logic you would actually need to uh, build inside your order formatting block. So additionally, another critical thing to maybe put in this block would be some kind of limit checking logic. So because we design these systems to be as fast as possible, um, any, any mistakes or any bugs or any you know, um, behavior you don't expect can be very costly. Uh, so it'd be a good idea to put a, a limit checking uh, code in here to make sure that you don't send, for example, too many orders per second or that the prices that you're sending to the exchange fall in, within some bound uh, that, you, that you control. Uh, once you've gone through all that, then we're gonna get to our TCP uh, stack. And yeah, well, one of the, one of the um, things that I think almost every exchange expects is that the orders that you place going back to the exchange are encoded in, in TCP. Um, which is a bit of a headache uh, for us. Uh, bring, doing TCP means a lot of state tracking. Um, there's sequence numbers to worry about, that kind of thing. Um, and as well, there are features of TCP. In fact, the hallmark of TCP is that it's reliable, um, which means you know, your, your message, your segment always gets to the other side. But when you really zoom in on what that means, it means that if you send a segment and it's never acknowledged by the remote, that you need to send it again. And that means a lot of state management and buffering and, and that kind of thing, um, which is a bit of a headache. Finally, uh, we'll get to the, to the output uh, Mac here where we can again re-encode this information at the, at the lowest level to be retransmitted back to the exchange to try and make our, our trade happen. Now, we call this, this loop, uh, we call this our, our critical path or our hot, hot path, right? I mean, this is, we try to make this path as fast as possible. Um, as of a couple of years ago, uh, we were well below 200 nanoseconds. Um, that would be from, from the time that the, you know, the first bit hits the pin of the network connector uh, on the FPGA card until the first bit hits the pin on the, on the egress side that went back to the exchange. Um, one, one element I didn't touch on on this is PCI Express. Uh, we still do make use of this, um, and it, we, we make use of this for um, status and control. So we will have a software application still running on a traditional server above us, um, but that's used for a couple of reasons. One is, yeah, making sure that whatever logic you're doing here, the kind of orders that you're sending back to the exchange look sane and sensible and make sense, uh, but as well control. So when, when does it make sense to turn this thing off 
Um, do we want to do more configuration on what kind of uh, multicast groups do we let through? Uh, that kind of thing. Uh, so finally, last slide, uh, how do we approach design differently um, at Optiver compared to other companies which make use of FPGAs? First one is the technical side. Um, there's a couple things here. One is, is pipelining. Um, yeah, I think for most you know, digital designers, you know, they're taught to pipeline their design, right? That's just how you, how you do it. You put a register on, this, on the input and a register on the output, and that's just what you do. For us, that's, that's almost never what we want to do um, because every register in our hot path is latency, and we just can't afford to do that. Um, an interesting uh, flip side of this point is that uh, for time enclosure, um, you know, I think for most engineers, when, when time enclosure is easy, that's great. That means you don't need to worry about it and you can go on to think about the next thing. Um, for us, it's not really the case. If time enclosure is too easy, then that probably means there's a clock cycle somewhere we can save. So we'll deliberately try and, and make timing harder. Uh, well, as a result, if we can save a clock somewhere, uh, yeah, we can, we can make it faster. Um, so the, the net result is that we're kind of perpetually in a state where timing is irritatingly hard to meet but not impossible, um, which I, I don't think is very normal elsewhere in the, in the world. Um, second point here is, is best devices. Yeah, you know, we're, we're really on the, on the cutting edge here. We will invest and buy and whatever we need to do to make sure that we are on the, on the, on the, on the best possible footing we can be. Um, the last point here is around custom designed IP. A lot of FPGA vendors, of course, provide a lot of, um, you know, pre-built, pre-packaged IP for you to use, like FIFOs and that kind of thing. We don't generally make use of this stuff, at least not in our hot path. Uh, most, most of this um, IP, it's robust and, and tested, but it's not designed for low latency um, purposes. So we tend to hand design um, everything in our hot path. Uh, the second uh, class of things on how we approach things differently is, is more environmental. Um, one is uh, we have a real tight feedback loop on our work. Um, I think whereas in some companies you might not see the result of your work for, for weeks or months or maybe even years, um, in our environment you could be making a change to the code base, you know, test benching it, going through a regression suite, but seeing you know, a release out the next day and having it deployed and running and you can see the result of your work literally the next day, um, not only seeing it running, but also seeing its impact on, let's say the success of a trading strategy. We are so dependent on, on latency for some of these things that you can really see the impact um, directly. The second point is around being a high paced environment. Trading is really dynamic. Um, there's, things are changing all the time around the world. Uh, exchanges change the way that they operate. Um, opportunities we perceive uh, um, come quickly. So there's uh, it's very rarely a dull day, uh, I think, in Optiver. There's always something new uh, coming. I think the last point um, I wanted to highlight was on yeah, innovative solutions. Um, yeah, tying into the fact that we don't pipeline, for example, uh, means that in order to solve some of the problems that we have without introducing latency, you have to get real out of the box thinking. And that could be thinking about novel ways to achieve a, a comparison or to accomplish some logic, um, which, yeah, it, it's nice to always have that kind of fresh challenge uh, present on, on a daily basis. Um, so yeah, I, I think that was, that was my presentation. Um, thanks for joining me for this. Uh, I don't think I have much time to take questions now. However, I will be present in the, in the Optiver uh, virtual booth, um, I believe it's 7.15 uh, European time. So uh, happy to take any more questions or any, any other things you want to know. Happy to talk uh, in that venue. Thanks.